Good evening and welcome everyone. Tonight, the Science Cafe is honored to host Nobel Laureate and MIT professor Peter Diamond for a chat on his life journey, search theory, social security, and contemporary macroeconomic issues. My name is Susan Eastland and I am on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank the Cary Library Foundation. Their support enables us to bring programs like today's event to you all. The Foundation plays a unique role with the Science Cafe series and produces the content for these programs. We would also like to thank the Lucius Beeb Memorial Library and the Public Libraries in Rockport and Tewksbury for partnering with us on this event tonight. We are running this program in a hybrid format, so we thank everyone both here in the library and online for your patience. This program is being recorded and we will be posting it to the library's YouTube channel. There will be a time at the end for questions. For everyone here, please raise your hand and I'll bring over a mic. And for everyone online on Zoom, please submit your questions for the Q&A. Steve Yang will be your host for the evening. Steve received his BS in chemistry from UC Berkeley in 1998 and his PhD in biology from MIT in 2004. After graduate school, he worked as the chief operations officer of a research laboratory in the University of in Indonesia that focuses on HIV and cancer. He then became a management consultant in McKinsey and Company in Jakarta and Singapore. Currently, he is the managing director of Matiska Pharma, a pharmaceutical group based in Indonesia. He is active in pursuing research in oncology and is currently leading a research program in the U.S. He is also on the board of several biotech companies along with our very own Cary Library Foundation. Steve, welcome. I am now going to hand the evening off to you to host and introduce our special guest for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Cary Library Science Cafe. Oh. <laughs> is this on? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's good. Okay, I can't tell the difference. So please let me know if you cannot hear me. Uh, welcome again. Uh, we are very excited and very honored to welcome Professor Peter Diamond, a distinguished professor, a world-renowned influential economist, and also a long-term resident of Lexington. Peter is a, an institute professor at MIT and also a professor emeritus at the Department of Economics at MIT. And he was famously the co-recipient of the 2010 Nobel Prize winner in Economic Sciences uh, for the analysis of markets with search frictions, uh, something that we will talk about uh, in this uh, seminar. <coughs> he has more than 150 academic papers to his name and has written 12 books and numerous reports and briefs. He has taught and worked on public policy economics throughout his career, including analysis of taxes and social security systems in the US and around the world. This is something that we will also talk about. He served as an advisor to the Federal Government's Advisory Council on Social Security and is a member of numerous scientific and economic societies, including as president of the American Economic Association. I think we'll have a wonderful chat uh, tonight about his experiences and about economics. Peter, welcome to the Science Cafe. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Now let's start off like how we usually do as tradition here at the Science Cafe. Uh, please share with us your early experiences, uh, your upbringing, and uh, how uh, up to your college experience, perhaps. Well, my grandparents, uh, all four of them immigrants from Eastern Europe. My parents, both born uh, in New York City and lived in the New York metropolitan area their entire lives, if you don't count World War II. Uh, and uh, my mother was very proud of that she completed high school. Uh, that was not common in either her family or her friends. And then she went to work as a bookkeeper until my older brother was born. And under the customs of the 30s, uh, that was the end of that. Hmm. Uh, my father graduated high school, Dewey Clinton High School, which was an elite high school that got shut down for some reason, but recently reopened. I was pleased. Uh, and then he went, as you could at the time, directly from high school to law school to Brooklyn Law School at night. So he sold shoes during the day, as he put it, 
he did his homework on the subway and then went to Brooklyn at night. So I started school in the New York public school system, but I was in second grade when we moved out to Long Island and I had a fully conventional suburban education. Maybe if we had stayed in the Bronx, I might have gone to Bronx Science and who knows what would have been different. But it was a good high school, but just an ordinary good suburban high school. So when it was time to go to college, I had no help from my parents and sort of thinking about things. And I had some observations of what my brother had done because he had completed college and had prepared during college to become a CPA and accountant at the end, although he turned out not to pursue that career. So my thinking in high school was the role of college is to come out so you're prepared to have a reasonable career. The choice of a school for me was a non-problem. The analog back in the 50s to the current early action kinds of things is the guidance counselor at the high school had a one-on-one relationship with admissions in a number of places. And roughly once every other year with a suitable candidate, he can make a deal with Yale. So as a fall of senior year, the guidance counselor called three of us into his office and said, you can go here, you can go there, you can go there. Is that what you want? And I said, yes, dumb question as far as I was concerned. And so off I went to Yale giving it no real thought. But I had to pick a major before I showed up. And so what I knew was I liked math and science in high school and I did better with them than the other subjects. So I wanted something down that line and I wanted something that would connect to a career. But what did I know about careers? My father was a lawyer and that wasn't where a math and science would take one. Although obviously if you work on patents and things like that, a little science and engineering background is a boost. And so I knew that some of the fathers, those were the only relevant candidates at the time, some of the fathers were engineers. So I decided to major in engineering. And then I had to pick one. So I've never done anything with my hands, construction or fixing things. And I'm, for lack of a better word, a bit clumsy. So I thought, what kind of engineering would have not only the least use of your hands, but the least use of the kind of background of how things work. So I signed up for electrical engineer. That meant freshman year, I'm taking math and science and a couple of engineering, one semester engineering things, and the other subjects as I'm going down the set of requirements that Yale then had for touching a whole bunch of different fields. And at the time, there was a big area of freshman dorms, and the freshman dorms had graduate students living in them as sort of advisors. And one day, I'm guessing it was February, I wandered into the next entry over where my guidance counselor was, and he wasn't there, but his roommate was. And his roommate was an electrical engineer and graduate student. And for some reason, which I still don't quite understand, he pulled down one of his textbooks and started showing me the kinds of equations in them. And his wording has never gone out of my head. These equations are hairy, he said. And I looked at them and I thought, they didn't look like fun. So I left his dorm room that day 
uh, and went back to think about what I really wanted to major in. And I realized it was very simple. There was the class I liked the most, which was introductory calculus. That didn't exist in my high school. And the class in which I was doing best was introductory calculus. So I became a math major. Uh, that was the extent of analysis. Uh, and uh, that meant that uh, the next year, I would have this program laid out for me, uh, some number of math classes, and the natural next class would be second year calculus. Uh, Yale at the time, for reasons that still baffle me, gave college credits for high school classes. I had no high school classes you would think of in current AP terms, but they gave me credit for a few of them, two or three, I don't remember. And so the message was, if I could complete the classes in my major and take the normal five classes every semester, I could graduate in three years rather than four. Uh, and I thought, I don't know if I want to do this. I was loving college. In fact, the one sentence summary of my career is I went to college, I loved it, I never left. <laughs> and, um, but I thought, who knows what I'll feel like, I'll, I'll speed it up. So the question was how to do that, and I went to one of the, uh, the advisors in the math department, and he said, the second year, calculus course follows very closely off uh, this textbook by George Thomas, MIT mathematician, uh, who I was to meet a couple of years later, unknown at the time. So that summer, I read the calculus book and I went back uh, and sat the final exam and passed. Uh, and so there I was launched, uh, I'll be taking two math courses, uh, advanced math courses, and on track to finish if I wanted. Now, even, even though you uh, started off with very little analysis in your major choice, um, you ended up doing extremely well in, in your major as a math major. You, you graduated summa cum laude. Yeah, I was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but just to be clear, um, among my classmates, uh, there were two who were clearly better than me. Mm. There was one I thought, that's about my level. Uh, I didn't know him well, so that was a bit hazy. And there was one I was clearly better than. Uh, and of those four, one of them switched to psychology, and the other three had careers as math professors. So mm. I, I wasn't out of it, yeah. uh, but I also wasn't a star. Among the classes I took in my second year was Introduction to Economics. Uh, Yale was doing an experiment at the time. I have no idea why, but in addition to the introductory economics class as a large lecture, in the biggest lecture hall, with one session a week with graduate students, they offered introductory economics as a small seminar held in my residential college, not on the main campus. This was some experiment to try to breathe some intellectual life into dormitories. I don't imagine it had any effect, but I had an assistant professor and a class of a dozen. And not only was I interested in economics, but he was friendly and we became friends. And um, as I planned my next year, so that was year two, uh, two math courses out of the way, and I had ticked off all the requirements across subjects. So I still had three math courses to go. And as an honors major, uh, one of them would be the uh, honors seminar that happened every year. And one of them, at least one of them, or oh, there's two I needed, uh, had to satisfy the requirement for an honors graduation, which you either write a thesis or you take and pass a graduate class. And I had told, nobody could remember the last time somebody tried to write a thesis. Uh, so I signed up for two graduate classes, as did uh, my colleagues. Uh, and 
something very odd was going on. There were a number of us who um, weren't sure we wanted economics, so we wanted mathematics. So there was some exploration of other things, including in particular economics. I'll get back to that in a moment. But the first thing that happened was I thought there are some very famous classes at Yale in the history department. I'll take one of them. I hadn't had a history class. Um, I'll pick one. And each of the three I was interested in were being taught by a visitor. The famous professor was on leave. So that happenstance meant I went to the faculty member I was friendliest with, my economics teacher, and said, what would you recommend that I take? And he said, why don't you take honors, intermediate, micro, and macro? Um, I, being an undergraduate, thought you had to be an honors major to take an honors class. Uh, but I guess he was able to arrange it for me. Uh, Peter, perhaps I can interject. Uh, okay, you don't mind. speed it up. Yeah. <laughs> I loved that class. I then applied for graduate school in both math and economics. I started at MIT taking classes in both departments, and it was clear to me which one I liked more and which one I was better at. Yeah, you were in graduate school at MIT, economic department, during the time of uh, Paul Samuelson and Bob Solow, uh, giants in the economics. What was the environment uh, like then? that kind of environment at MIT? The stunning thing about the MIT economics department is the environment which they created in the 50s. Before Paul Samuelson left Harvard, uh, in large part around anti-Semitism, and went to MIT. MIT didn't have a graduate program. It was really a service department. And with his coming and uh, the faculty that were there and support by the Institute, it turned into a graduate department. The first graduates coming 47, I think, anyway, shortly after the war. And the style that Paul set and Bob Solo, who was one of the early faculty added, there were some there before Paul, uh, was to be very much focused on the graduate students. MIT being MIT, uh, there were very few undergraduate majors. So it wasn't like Harvard, where the undergraduate economics major is some years the largest undergraduate major. Sometimes it's only second. Uh, needless to say, at MIT, uh, half the undergraduates are in electrical engineering uh, and economics is a, a tiny trail. And some of them are people who came to MIT for economics, aware of uh, the reputation. And so the focus on your door is open, students are supposed to feel comfortable just walking in to ask a question. Um, and teaching is important and collegiality among the faculty uh, is a big part of it, and friendly interactions with the students is a big part of it. Yeah. And that's what I experienced, that's the way it is now. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the rating of the graduate program at the top or tied for the top is unchanged yeah. for, what, 70 years now? Yeah, yeah. Very, very awesome. So you, you um, when you graduated, you obtained your PhD, and you started um, as an assistant professor in Berkeley. Mm, what, what did you work on uh, in the beginning? Uh, well, first of all, my dissertation, which was a standard style at the time, was three unrelated essays. Um, and as long as they were publishable in legitimate places, three of them was the count to get count as a thesis. Um, so the, in part, what I was doing was converting those into publications. Uh, and in part, what I was doing was my first serious teaching. And I was teaching an undergraduate public finance class that had been, along with economic theory, my two prime subjects to be examined in, uh, in the PhD program. And uh, 
What was unusual about this class, Berkeley, of course, is a very large university, so there are lots of uh, students, uh, was a year-long class, not a semester. And it was only for honors majors. Who, honors majors is the wrong term. It was only for people who were, had already completed intermediate, micro, and macro for a whole year. So I had the typical classes only one semester. I had a leisurely time to develop for the students an appreciation of the theory with their sort of background already uh, and to get into subjects. And so I started teaching this. And one of the beauties in my experience from teaching is you read the literature that's relevant, the literature being used in the other classes. And then I think, do I really like this? And if not, can I design something better? So what began as a handout uh, to the juniors and seniors in this class uh, became my first major publication in the American Economic Review uh, on the public debt, uh, but it came immediately out of the process of thinking about the literature from the point of view of teaching it. Yeah. And you also have um, a pretty interesting solution to uh, another instance when when you sort of are stuck with um, coming up with uh, research topics you enrolled in a law school uh, tell us about that okay well first i've got to fill in the opening part of my career the uh, first decade or so uh, i never lacked for something i was working on that i was excited about um, and Suddenly, about a decade in, I realized I didn't have anything like that. And part of it was I was teaching the same classes. Uh, part of it was the research area that I had drawn out a couple of papers that I was excited about in that area. Um, I had exhausted both of those. And I realized I needed a new method for finding things that would stimulate my recognizing something that would be worth digging into. And so I decided I would take classes at Harvard Law School. I took one a year for four years. I took them seriously. I sat all the exams. Um, and frankly, I loved it. What I realized when I realized, even though I was walking there, so we were, Kate and I were living in Cambridge at the time, I was getting there very early. Uh, I had no traffic issues, had no parking issues. And why am I here in this classroom so early? And I realized I loved being in a classroom where I had no responsibilities. <laughs> uh, so I got a number of papers written out of that, and it also posed a frame in which actually I made an important advance in search theory, came by recognizing a simple law and economics problem that would require the kind of framing that I came from. The other thing I did at the time was I got a phone call asking, was I willing to be on a panel uh, for the Senate Finance Committee on the future of Social Security because the actuaries were saying it was blowing up and had to be fixed in a hurry. And they wanted a simple question, is that true? And I was one of half a dozen economists, actuaries, uh, who did a report and said, yes, it is true. Yeah, yeah let's talk about these uh, two topics, search theory and also social security separately. Um, now, you, uh, your Nobel Prize recognized your work on search and matching theory. Can you describe to us briefly what this theory is all about? The kind of economics you teach in an introductory class, kind of economics I was taught you learn about markets, demand, and supply, and you learn there is a price that clears the market. Uh, as we all know, um, you don't know the price in stop and shop until you walk in. And particularly when I was writing this in the uh, late 60s, uh, you didn't look up prices on the internet. Uh, and this is obviously also true in the labor market. You 
don't know that there's a job available somewhere unless you go examining it. Uh, and the um, fact we again all experience is the price of milk is different at the different supermarkets around the neighborhood. Uh, and actually I was told by one of my professors when I was an undergraduate, uh, I guess they weren't paid very well. He always visited two supermarkets when he went out for his groceries. Uh, he would look at prices, go to the other one if it was better, buy, and if not, go back and buy. Uh, but he knew generally because these places have styles of what they cut their prices in wherever you do the shopping. So the idea of search theory is, and it started with, in my case on the retail market, not the labor market, is if you don't know the prices in other places, and to keep the story simple, the only way you can find out is make a visit. You're in a store, you've quoted a price, you have some idea what the prices are like elsewhere. It's not like gas stations, you drive by and you see lots of different prices. Um, so you say, should I buy at this price or should I go visit another one to see if it's better? And I was looking for the process of how prices would get set when that was the environment, not just in which the shoppers behave, but the stores were setting prices knowing that the shoppers had this problem. And of course, the simplest environment to get an idea of what might be going on was all the stores are identical, the costs are identical. There's no difference across stores and all the consumers are identical. There's no difference across consumers. And then to my surprise, and it was a total surprise to me, what happens in this market is you get the monopoly price as if all the stores had gotten together and colluded and set the same price. And the reason is if they're all charging the same price, there's no reason for you to go anywhere else. But if there's no reason for you to go anywhere else, there's no reason for the store not to charge you yeah. the monopoly price. And they all had the same monopoly price. The literature went from that first bit, which was it didn't matter how small that cost was. It's enough to drive it that way into the more general idea, given heterogeneity, you get a distribution of prices, which again, you know, is a fact and the kinds of things that drive the distribution in terms of heterogeneity in both suppliers and demanders. Then the hard part for me, that part was easy. I mean, it was just have the basic idea and it solves itself. The hard part for me was figuring out how to do the labor market because the labor market has two sides, both of which are active. And when I went to work on it, I worked around the idea of a negotiated wage rather than one that's posted on a take it or leave it basis. And of course, we live uh, in a labor market where both of those are a big part of the story. Okay. Um, in, in your Nobel Prize uh, lecture, you emphasize the, imp the importance of developing models that are simple. Accurate. Um, can you discuss whether this actually works in practice <laughs> and whether economists actually follow this? Okay. Um, first, let me say uh, I frequently quote Alfred Marshall, the formal, the English economist of the turn of the last century, whose book was the book in economics in the late 19th century about the importance of simple models. And I'm describing this in the context of the common reference to toy models. And Marshall's view is the economy is a very complicated place. And the only way you'll get a full understanding of some piece is if you isolate what matters about that piece and get to fully understand it. Then you can go back, if you're thinking policy, 
of how to put together these various pieces. And you'll do that in two ways. One way is you'll work with a complicated model. Simple models, you can illustrate and prove theorems about their properties, about the things that influence prices or influence other aspects of it. In complicated models, you do simulations and then you compare it to the data. And you say, well, I've made reasonable enough assumptions for the simulation that now I'll ask a policy question. And that complements the issue. The, the simple models, the toy models, are telling you what parts of that big model are important and what parts may not be important for a particular policy question. And then the second thing you do is recognizing that the simulation is just an approximation is you go intuitively off the different pieces you know well and think about how that influences it. And this, of course, all happens in the context uh, that it's a political outcome. And the question is, how do you frame what is going to be helpful for the political process? And again, simple models, because they're easier to convey, is more information than, oh, I've run this complicated model, and the answer is you want a tax of 4%, and it doesn't convey much to your average voter. Yeah. And then the politicians say, thank you, and tax at 0%. <laughs> well, politicians, uh, first of all, have what are recognized problems that they want to be seen as addressing. Yeah. And secondly, they're aware that the voters are hearing uh, who is speaking, who is writing, who is being interviewed on right. different topics. Right. Well, let's, uh, let's move now to sort of more policy um, and a little bit of politics, uh, I should say, um, but still related to, to what you studied previously. Uh, you, you analyze for example, the long-term effects of a growing national debt on the economy. Um, as you know, the, the White House and, and the House of Representatives are battling over the extension of the debt limit currently. Um, this has happened many times uh, before. What's different now, do you think? What's happened many times, the, that there is a debt limit is something created, I think, during World War I. Uh, before that, there was no such animal, and the 14th Amendment says you're not about to allow to question uh, the federal debt. That was put in the 14th Amendment because there were uh, tensions after the Civil War about different debts that were held by different people, and the people, the members of Congress from the South who were beginning to come back uh, we're basically looking for making a mess on these things. So it got put in the Constitution uh, that they couldn't do what they had wanted to do in lowering the interest payments on some of the debt because some of the other interest payments were lower. And um, the normal practice is it became part of the law to have a debt limit. And when you got close to it, you would raise the debt limit, end of story. It happened three times under Trump. Uh, nobody noticed because it's such an obvious thing to do. Uh, the, a major factor in the Republican Party uh, believed that this is a good time to try to leverage getting more of their policies accepted, even though the White House and the Senate are not Republican. Uh, and so we are seeing, uh, again, we saw a bit of it under Obama, uh, a game of chicken. Uh, Obama, unfortunately, gave in just a little bit, uh, but perhaps more than he should have. Or, and Biden has said, no way, and we'll wait and see what happens. Right. Well, considering the U.S. national debt is at $31 trillion now and rising, um, it does sort of make sense to want to reduce it, that we want to reduce it, right? Um, but is it actually, how urgent is it actually to reduce this at this point in time? 
and stairs later on some sort of economic or political tipping point that we will have to encounter before the politicians say, okay, okay, now we have to really do this. Well, I, I think the, and a significant element on the debt is it affects the growth of the economy. And on the other hand, the debt is also a vital part of being able to deal with uh, expended expenses that are coming very heavily at a point in time. We ran up a huge debt, obviously, from what I said in the Civil War. We did it again in World War I and World War II. And the idea of we will raise the taxes enough to pay for World War II would have been crippling of the economy and also unfair to the generations who were also fighting it. The point about the debt is it does shift a lot of the need to pay taxes onto younger generations. From the normative point of view, that's a plus and a minus. Sometimes it's only fair to do that. Uh, sometimes it's people dumping problems on the next generation. Uh, it's, you know, same kind of thing you're hearing about climate change. And the same thing that is an issue uh, when Social Security started, they were giving the early cohorts who were very poor far more in benefits than their own contributions could possibly have covered. Yeah. And that meant labor workers would be getting less than they would have gotten if it wasn't for the earlier generation. So there is a major role for debt levels relative to GDP that fluctuate. And there's the peculiarity that if the interest rate on the debt is less than the growth rate of the economy, then the ratio of debt to GDP goes down over time, not up because of the interest costs. It could be going up or down because of other spending or other taxes, but just the endogenous part. Uh, and we've come out of a period of very low rates. We're in a period of very, of much higher rates, not out of line historically. And nobody knows what's coming next. Are we gonna go back to low rates or not? So the issue of how quickly you should try to adjust the debt level uh, doesn't have a clean answer because you would want to know what those future interest rates are yeah. if you could know in order to figure out whether you'd be doing something quickly, slowly, worrying, not worrying. Now, there has been an attempt in empirical studies to recognize what's also referred to as a tipping point not as part of the politics, but we know with lots of countries, suddenly the willingness to hold their debt collapses. And this is mostly third world yeah. countries, and they go into financial crisis. Right. So the question to ask is, is there a magical place where if the debt to GDP ratio gets to that number, the US will like some of these other countries, have a financial crisis. And uh, there have been serious analyses of this, and nobody has come up with a simple answer. Yeah. Uh, and looking around the world, the debt to GDP ratio in Japan is vastly higher than ours. And I'm sure you're all aware the birth rate in Japan is a lot lower than ours. And we are much more open to immigrants who are going to have jobs and pay taxes than all the Japanese. So if you say, oh, well, if they can do it, we can do it. I don't know that you should say that. But if you could, you could say, well, this is something that very much, as with climate change, is a fairness issue across generations. Right. But it's not a crisis. Right. Now, how, how does the, the death level affect programs like Social Security? The trust fund actually lends to the government. The, let me not get into the complications of the interaction of the Social Security 
budgets and the rest of the federal program. Um, that has economic and more seriously political controversies about it. So let's just focus on the fact that Social Security, as created, invests only in federal debt. And this is not the common practice in advanced countries. Um, Canadians look like a Middle East sovereign wealth fund. They're invested in everything around, and they're carefully carved away from the political process. It's an independent group. The uh, Norwegians, the Swedes do the same sort of thing uh, in programs that somewhat resemble ours. Uh, so the choice was made in the 30s that they wouldn't invest in the stock market. Uh, the Republicans were violently opposed to it and talked of this as the end of capitalism. Uh, well, actually, Greenspan said more or less the same thing when Clinton floated the idea of letting Social Security invest in um, index funds. Uh, nothing more complicated than that. Uh, so, and the Democrats wanted to be more generous to the early cohorts who were so poor coming out of the Great Depression. So both sides were not looking to have an investment-oriented system. So we have that debt, and unusually across countries, I don't know of any other country with a similar rule, Social Security is not allowed to borrow, and general revenues do not automatically flow. In lots of countries, um, they look at the Social Security budget, they don't build up much of a fund, uh, and then as needed uh, with the political process, money gets transferred from general revenues. We don't do that. It would take legislation to do that. There's nothing in the Constitution to stop it, but that's the current law. So the current law says if the trust fund hits zero, then the spending on benefits plus administrative costs cannot exceed the revenue that is coming into Social Security. And that's the payroll tax, but also part of the income taxation of Social Security benefits. And it's been estimated by the Office of the Actuaries that in order to live with this rule, they would have to cut benefits by approximately 20% for everybody. And if nothing ever changed, that fraction would slowly grow. Uh, keep in mind, the baby boomers retiring is what has boosted the cost of Social Security dramatically. And needless to say, uh, they're not going to last forever. Uh, and so as they die out and the new cohorts coming in are not so large relative to the population, the, but people are expected to live longer, the costs will go on rising, but very slowly, not the rapid change we have now. The 1983 legislation, when we were in a, a couple of months of a benefit cut across the board, put in place a buildup of a fund that was expected to then be run down under the baby boom. Uh, the projection at the time was the design would work for just barely 75 years. They knew 76 was a problem uh, under their projection. Uh, and if it turns out to be 50 years rather than 75, uh, that's not so bad. Yeah. This was the Greenspan Commission in 1983. Uh, uh, it's, the, the politics is more complicated than saying that, but the Greenspan Commission uh, played an important role in the process. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there was some political um, in the background. Yes. Mm. Do you think uh, this is what's going to happen again? Uh, no, the, the trust fund is estimated to last until 2035. Do you think that the same thing is going to happen again in 2033 or 34, where a commission will be formed to recommend for the next 75 years what's the, what's the strategy 
to make social security solvent. Well, the role of the commission in part is to get everyone agree on what are the parameters, what would it take to do the traditional 75 year horizon, or what would it take to do less if they decide to try to do less. Uh, that rather than having them agree on a package yeah. is a critical idea, though being the showcase for a package still really matters. Yeah. Um, I mean, Bush had a commission and nothing came from it. Right? The um, thing to keep in mind is there's nothing but bad news coming. <laughs> So what are the two pieces? You either need more tax revenue or you need lower benefit growth. Maybe depends on how quickly you need the money, whether you cut benefits right away or you just say, here's the current benefit formula. We're going to shrink that formula slowly over time. So a 40 year old will be getting less but the 40 year old has no idea what he's getting anyway. So politically down the road, that has some possibility. So if it's only bad news that comes from it, uh, what candidate for election wants to be in favor of bad news? Oh, there is the other piece, which Clinton said, well, if we invest in stocks, and then the projection will be on average over a long horizon, the rate of return will be larger. So that's a cheap way of getting a piece, but it's way too small yeah. for what's involved. Yeah. So um, I think it's unlikely that we would get um, the government willing to address it uh, before it becomes seen by the public yeah. as close enough to be critical. Right. Well, we've got the dark cloud in the, in the horizon. And one last question from me before I really ask the audience to, uh, if they have questions. What advice would you give uh, to young people who are considering majoring in economics? <laughs> <laughs> Keep a this this may, may sound like uh, uh, imitate me, but have the equivalent of a math major. And what I didn't do, and they should study statistics and econometrics as well as mathematics. The separate study of statistics is a vital part. Particularly, my career has been as a theorist. I've done empirical work, uh, always with a co-author who knew what he was doing. I happen never to have worked with some of my female colleagues at MIT who I have some of, we overlap, we talk, but never had a co-author. Uh, and uh, my background is such that uh, I was naturally drawn to the theory and I also liked it better than what I was learning in econometrics. Perhaps if as an undergraduate I had, had a firmer grounded, I might have had a different view, but I don't think so. Very good. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we, we open up for, for questions. I think um, we'll go up to the floor first and then to the Zoom. Please. I'm, I'm glad I've seen a, uh, uh, someone who almost went into electrical engineering. <laughs> uh, I've, I've been in for 45 years doing something called control systems engineering. It's uh, all feedback loops. I worked on things like precision positioning of silicon wafers for imaging and stuff. Now, that's all done by computer algorithms. Yeah. Now, I'm thinking the Federal Reserve, uh, they uh, do the uh, interest rate changes. Is it just a bunch of men around the table full of human error trying to figure out what to do? Why can't they automate this system? Because they, they're getting all the data coming in and they're doing, doing a very good job of collecting it. but. Uh, why can't they determine it by computer? First of all, both the Federal Reserve Board in Washington 
and all the regional banks like the one in Boston have large research staffs that build large computerized models simulating the growth in the future. And they are very much uh, aware of the academic literature on the subject. Uh, I don't know that anyone has turned to chat GBT and said, <laughs> forecast next year's unemployment rate and inflation rate as a function of uh, the interest rates we would like to set and the extent to which we go on doing the quantitative tightening. The interest rate is always the focus of the news, but just as during the big recession, uh, the federal government was buying a lot of debt, now they're in the process of reducing those holdings. Uh, so uh, I would have no objection to having uh, an answer from Chad GBT, but I'd have some skepticism. Yeah. More questions? So interest rate tightening seems like a very blunt tool to accomplish what uh, is being done. Uh, I just want to check to make sure that I'm not missing something. If we had a system of uh, intelligent taxation, wouldn't that be more immediate and perhaps more surgical than something as blunt as interest rate tightening, which is really going to hurt people at the bottom of the pile more than uh, everybody else? Um, there are uh, a couple of pieces to do on that. Uh, first of all, in the Nixon years, they did turn to fiscal policy and made a god-awful mess of it. The second thing is central banks used to make an awful mess of it, and that includes the 70s, until the worldwide campaign to try to have your central bank be independent of the government took hold. Uh, and since then, this admittedly crude element, which is an important part of it, uh, is there. And you've got to keep in mind, uh, it's a two-way street. We go into a recession, we want them to be boosting lending, uh, which they have two tools. One is buying or selling uh, bonds out there. Uh, and when they buy up federal debt, the people who would have bought that are looking for other things to move their money to. And the interest rate they set for basically the banks who borrow from them. Um, so I think you don't want to give up either of those tools because they were coming and going. We do have what are called built-in stabilizers on the fiscal side. So when incomes drop because of uh, unemployment, uh, the taxes they pay drop automatically. We have that partially built in. There is an academic literature that has never really caught on that in the design of ordinary taxes, uh, you could have stronger automatic stabilizers. So the unemployment insurance system, I think it's still there. I haven't kept up on changes. Normally has somewhat different rules if the unemployment rate gets high enough. It becomes more generous. So that's an automatic adjustment that is a stabilizer. And then there is an academic literature uh, that says we could do better, just as you said. Uh, but I don't think anyone thinks it would be enough to do away with the central bank's efforts. And the politics of trying to create that, uh, I'm not aware of any country that's pulled it off. Uh, and we are not at the top end of cooperative cross-party uh, design of a new institution. Yeah. Over here in the middle, there's a question. Oh, oh, there. Okay. Um, so I love your uh, the story that you gave about your uh, seemingly Jose high school uh, career, um, and it reminds me of um, 
you know, these stories I read of the amazing you know, farm boys who went on to design and build atomic bombs and made fundamental breakthroughs in you know, aeronautics and radar and computing. Um, and they all somehow did this without Kruman and Russian School of Math. <laughs> so my question for you is, uh, do you think that um, pushing right, our, our kids to really show academic prowess at the early ages that you know, we're, we're doing now, is, the, is this helpful? Or is it okay for us um, to wait for the college years to actually develop this kind of talent? Um, well, first let me clarify my own education. Uh, did not include very much high school math. It was just, for example, I had no calculus in high school. Uh, and now, of course, high schools go not only into calculus, but in, into the follow-up subjects. What is the right timing for that, for different intellectual developments? I don't know. I've always thought it was an advantage of the American system over the British system, is we do less specialization at early ages than they do. So expansion, having enough time to explore different things, say through the high school level, and through college for that matter, uh, is a plus. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, on the athletic side, uh, the kind of people who focused on just one sport their whole lives are much more prone to injuries than the people who grew up and had serious careers in multiple sports, because you're using different muscles, you're developing in a more balanced way. So there, the underlying core of the point you're making, of the value of diverse experiences, I'm squarely with. How much, when, I think that's the kind of thing one has to study and think about carefully. I don't have, I don't have a comment. We have time for one more question. Right there, I think, that. Uh, in, in the uh, hi, Peter. Um, I really loved your talk. It was really inspiring. As a student who's looking to major in economics in my undergraduate degree, um, that was very interesting to me. And um, so going back to research theory, um, with our um, like techno technological um, developments these days and with the rise of like online shopping and it greatly decreases like the search that you were talking about for new prices. Um, how would that like affect um, how prices are? Would that be like a monopolical um, circumstance where because to, to the customers, it's essentially one platform of the internet. And, or how would, would, would you think like that would apply to our future? Um, there's a part that makes the kind of concerns I talk about less important and a part that makes it much more important. Uh, the first question is obviously if you have to walk from stop and shop over to um, our wagon basket. wheel, um, that's an expensive way to check a price. Obviously, if you're at your computer uh, and you look up the price from two different places and then you go get it or you order it and it's delivered, uh, that's much smaller. Uh, it might be fun to have a show of hands of how many people buy online without checking for a second price. Um, I don't know how typical I am, but actually for used books, well, I don't check for a second price because I know which website is usually lower. Yeah. Uh, and usually is just enough to bring in the effects, usually lower in the distribution of prices. Says the higher ones are still out there. Uh, you buy a used book on Amazon versus buying it uh, 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 on the used book, one which Amazon also owns. Uh, they're, they're different prices. So the basic phenomenon is there. Uh, and yes, there are more people who are shopping around than my teacher did with two supermarkets over things you can do online. And that affects the distribution of prices, absolutely. What scares me 
is given how much they know of me, uh, they could be quoting me a different price than they quote anybody else who shows up at the same time on the computer, much less different times. We're all comfortable with the idea uh, that taxis and Ubers have different prices at different times of day. And you know about it ahead of time because it has to do with getting more supply for when you get more demand. Uh, but if there are things you don't know about how they're going to be priced, uh, then you become quite vulnerable. And if the computer knowing, they may not know anything except I live in Lexington. That might be enough to charge me a higher price uh, because I can afford it, or a lower price because I may be an academic who shops around. Uh, it's the first one I worry about. Uh, so I think we need serious regulation, as we have regulation on things like taxes and time of day variation, uh, to stop the abuse, the quantitative effects are obviously different, uh, but the qualitative problem isn't going away as far as I can see. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, Peter. With that, uh, let's conclude tonight's um, Science Cafe. Let's thank Peter once more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.